Edgeworks Nebula. An emerging market and movement around psilocybin is proving to help with mental health, PTSD, anxiety, and depression. Schedule 35 is the most trusted and most popular microdosing source in North America, helping hundreds of thousands of individuals improve their daily lives. Studies have shown that psilocybin works by creating new neural networks in the brain, which help boost focus, creativity, mood enhancement, and help fight addiction. All products come with guides that make microdosing accurate and easy to understand. Right now, Schedule 35 is offering 15% off with code STS when you head to Schedule 35, that's number 35.co. That's 15% off at Schedule35.co and use code STS. Just a reminder, all customers will need to be manually age verified first before they are able to purchase. Ages 19 and up in Canada and 21 and up in the U.S. Start living life with a deeper meaning, more joy, and self-understanding today. Hey folks, this is Lacey Hannon. Welcome to Settle the Stars. We're glad to have you back. Right now, we're going through some of the biggest sci-fi stories to hit your screens. Our aim is to explore space science through the lens of public presentation. We all know there's a lot of bad fake science out there. CSI, anyone? But where do science, its history, and entertainment intersect? When is it about realism? And when is it about the emotional responses the director wants to stir in you? I promise this won't last forever. But over here at Edgeworks Entertainment, we are fascinated by what gets people excited and where the passion for space starts for you, our kind of people. And a good story can be what sets off a zillion questions, some of which have answers. So I invite you to take the journey with me. Once upon a time, in 1964, the year 2001 was the distant future and a somewhat arbitrary goalpost for humanity's fledgling ambitions to explore space in the imaginations of a legendary sci-fi writer and a no less legendary filmmaker. The late 50s and early 60s had seen the Americans and Soviets working tirelessly to be the first to conquer space. The amount of resources being funneled into either country's space programs and the new technologies that were rapidly developing must have made the far reaches of space feel more attainable than ever. Who knew what the next 35 years could bring? Manned missions to Jupiter? Cryogenic space travel? Video calls between Earth and orbit? These possibilities and more like them prompted Stanley Kubrick and Arthur C. Clarke to embark on the project of a lifetime a realistic cinematic speculation of where space exploration could be at the dawn of the 21st century. It was a collaboration that would revolutionize how people viewed science fiction movies in general, proving the genre had greater potential than all the B-pictures with flying saucers on strings would suggest. 2001 would also inspire the careers of many auteurs and visual effects pioneers who became big names in science fiction, including Steven Spielberg, George Lucas, and Christopher Nolan who were all equally dazzled by what Kubrick and Clark were able to achieve before the first images of Earth were ever captured from space. The legacy of 2001 A Space Odyssey speaks for itself. Through parody and homage, Kubrick's space opus has continued to play a significant role in the discourse of cinema, up to the year of its namesake and beyond. You can't hear the bombastic percussion and brass of Also Sprach Zarathustra, without picturing the ancestor of man flinging a bone into the sky, or a dramatic camera pan to a moon-sized baby floating in space. Nor can you hear the Blue Danube waltz without thinking of a balletically spinning spacecraft and the in-flight service of the future moving about the cabin in Velcro grip shoes. Iconic imagery and soundtrack aside, the film's greatest achievement just might be how realistically it approached the technology and physics of space travel, and just how much of the future 2001 managed to predict. Neither of these points should necessarily come as a surprise, seeing as Kubrick was collaborating with not just one of the biggest names in science fiction, but someone who had a great deal of personal experience in aeronautics and astronautics. In addition to writing a number of nonfiction books on the science of flight and space travel, Clark served as the president and chair of the British Interplanetary Society. 
He had been fascinated by the possibility of space travel all his life and fortuitously lived during a time when he got to see fiction rapidly turning into reality. Kubrick approached Clark with the idea of teaming to make a really good science fiction movie, end quote, as he put it. As Kubrick was accustomed to working from books as source material, Clark showed him a number of stories he had written. Kubrick rejected them all and proposed Clark write an original novel for them to go off of. In writing 2001, Clark drew from ideas in several of his stories, including one from 1951 called The Sentinel. In The Sentinel, aliens leave a warning beacon on the moon, which alerts them once humanity has advanced enough to leave their planet. This artifact would become the mysterious monoliths that are encountered throughout the film. Kubrick took a completely serious approach to his vision of the future. He not only wanted everything to be scientifically accurate, but also as close as possible to the types of technology experts believed might exist in the year 2001. When it came to realizing the film's spacecraft, Kubrick turned to experts from NASA, including Clark's friend, Frederick Ordway, and Harry Lang, who headed up NASA's Future Projects Division. While science fiction frequently portrays space vessels as sleekly as possible, going for what looks cool rather than what could actually function in space, Kubrick demanded that everything in their design serve a real-world purpose. Ordway later wrote that they insisted on knowing the purpose and functioning of each assembly and component, down to the logical labeling of individual buttons and the presentation on screens of plausible operating, diagnostic, and other data. All this attention to detail led to the creation of two very unique-looking spacecraft, the designs of which were informed by both physics and speculation as to where space travel was heading. The first of these seen in the film is Space Station 5, a transfer point and Hilton Hotel located not far outside the Earth's atmosphere. You can't accuse Kubrick of not doing his research on this one. In 1967, Baron Hilton was quoted as saying, Scarcely a day goes by when someone doesn't ask me, jovially, when the Lunar Hilton is going to be opened. They're joking, of course, but I don't see it as a joke at all. A Hilton in space would certainly be the one travel destination where you wouldn't feel guilty about staying indoors the whole time. On the inside, Space Station 5 looks like a retro futuristic airport terminal with big screen TVs on the walls and plush space age lounge chairs luxuriously spread out. On the outside, the space station takes the appearance of two giant wheels joined by a rotating axis. The design was modeled after what's known as the Von Braun wheel. In the early 1950s, aeronautical engineer Werner Von Braun proposed the idea of a spinning space station that could generate its own artificial gravity. The idea behind the design is that the centripetal force of the wheel's rotation would hold the passengers to the ground, thus mimicking gravity, similar to how race car drivers are held fast to their seats when their vehicles hug the curves. To date, a genuine Von Braun wheel has not been put into space. In a 2001 article, no relation to the film, NASA explained that they have not yet attempted to put a Von Braun wheel into space for two reasons. For one, they have no immediate need for artificial gravity, and in fact prefer zero-g environment of the ISS where the astronauts are able to carry out experiments in microgravity. And two, it takes time and resources to build a space station, despite how quickly Darth Vader had that second Death Star up and running in Return of the Jedi. The ISS was launched and built in pieces over time, explaining why, in NASA's own words, it looks like an erector set. Though it may not be as pleasing to the eye, it's logistically and financially more practical to launch pressurized modules that can be fitted together than it would be to build a big wheel in space. One of the wheels of Space Station 5 is actually shown to still be under construction in the film. Perhaps this was a small way for Kubrick to suggest how enormous of an undertaking it would be to actually build such a thing. Our podcast came out of a small startup company, Edgerix Entertainment. The success of our business hinged on growing and engaging our audience. With Squarespace, you can do just that and way more. From websites and online stores to marketing tools and analytics, Squarespace is the all-in-one platform to build a beautiful online presence and run your business. Okay, so one of the things I love about Squarespace is the social sharing. You are able to share new podcast episodes, sound bites, and pull quotes in order to spread the word about your show. As a gaming company, 
our technology has to be on point. We get it. With Squarespace, all your websites are optimized for mobile. Content automatically adjusts so you don't have to sweat how your content looks on a desktop or phone. Squarespace also gives you the opportunity to collect donations. So go ahead and start up that new project. With Squarespace, the possibilities are totally endless. Head to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com STS and you will save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. The second major spacecraft featured in the film is the Discovery One, the ship that transports astronauts Dave Bowman and Frank Poole from Earth orbit to Jupiter along with the rest of their cryogenically hibernating crew. The Discovery One has a distinctively thin and elongated shape with a bulbous head at the front. It looks very much like a wingless dragonfly. In fact, in the book, Clark describes the plasma jet-powered ship as having cooling fins that earned the craft the nickname Dragonfly. Kubrick decided to forego the fins, fearing their wing-like appearances would give audiences the wrong impression that the Discovery One somehow achieves spaceflight by gliding through an atmosphere. In Kubrick's vision of long-distance space travel, the Discovery One is powered by a nuclear thermal gas core reactor located at the ship's rear a good safe distance from the crew in the front as far as radiation goes. The science behind this propulsion method mainly came from Frederick Ordway. Around the time of 2001's development, NASA had been conducting studies on nuclear gas core reactors at the Lewis Research Center in Ohio. There was even a proposal made for a manned mission to Mars that would use this propulsion method, but funding was unfortunately pulled from research into nuclear thermal engines in the early 70s. The reason a gas core reactor was considered ideal for longer journeys through space was that it could theoretically reach higher temperatures than solid core reactors, thus delivering greater thrust and achieving faster space travel than other known methods. The Discovery One also comes with its own miniature version of the Von Braun wheel for artificial gravity. In one of the film's most visually astounding scenes, Astronaut Frank Poole can be seen jogging in an endless loop around the vertically oriented centrifuge. This is where the two astronauts are able to escape the zero-g for other parts of the ship during their journey to Jupiter, both for a sense of normalcy and as a way to avoid the harmful side effects of muscle and bone loss. Clark suggested that astronauts would eventually acclimate to transitioning between the ship's zero-g and artificial-g environments and experiments that were conducted at the Pensacola Naval Medical Research Laboratory in 1958 actually seemed to indicate that this might be possible. The test subjects who had to stay for extended periods of time in living quarters that were revolving at a speed of anywhere from 1 to 10 revolutions per minute initially experienced motion sickness and problems with balance. In time, most were able to adapt and were eventually even able to perform complex tasks. Upon returning to a stable grounded environment, however, the subject's issues with balance resumed and they began to experience false sensations of being in motion. The really interesting part, though, is that the assistants who had to intermittently run supplies to the test subjects eventually adapted to moving and functioning with ease in both the rotating and non-rotating environments. This suggests that the transitions made by the astronauts between zero-g and artificial-g in the film may in fact be possible, as Clark surmised. There are, of course, other matters to take into consideration with the scenario seen aboard the Discovery One. In the carousel, where Bowman and Poole get their artificial grab time, weightlessness increases the farther you are from the floor and the closer you are to the hub. In the film, we see one of the astronauts floating inside the hub before exiting through a panel and ascending a built-in ladder to the floor where the centripetal force takes over, grounding him again. But the version of a Von Braun wheel seen here is, of course, much smaller than the gigantic space station seen earlier in the film. This raises an interesting question. What would it be like for your head, which is closer to the hub, to feel more weightless than your feet? As with the issue of transitioning between zero and artificial G, you'd imagine the astronauts in Kubrick's 2001 would undergo the necessary training to acclimate to whatever sensations of disorientation they might anticipate before embarking on their mission. It's clear there are many factors that would be involved in adjusting to this kind of space habitat, and it's very possible periodic motion sickness or feelings of imbalance would simply come with the territory. But we gotta say, 
the ability to jump from wherever you're standing and grow increasingly weightless the closer you get to the ceiling would be pretty sweet compensation for any unpleasant side effects. All things considered, Bowman and Poole don't seem to have too bad a time of things during their flight. That is, until their AI pal Hal misdiagnoses a broken antenna, lip reads his human companions discussing whether they should disconnect him, and then does the totally normal, rational thing you would expect a computer to do by turning into a total homicidal maniac. Yes, 2001 is the film that caused everyone to start suspiciously eyeing their pocket calculators and washing machines and wondering if all these devices in service to humanity would violently rebel against us if they were just a bit smarter. Kubrick's thinking was that any machine that was as intelligent as a human and capable of learning by experience would naturally develop human emotions and be prone to having its own mental breakdown. That's what happens to Hal, at any rate. To avoid his potential termination, Hal cuts Poole loose in space when the astronaut goes to inspect the broken antenna. Bowman rushes to jump into his own EVA pod to save him, but of course, Hal has control over all of the ship's systems and isn't about to let Bowman come back inside. So Bowman does the only thing he can do. He manually opens the airlock and launches himself into the ship without a helmet. The scene is actually played very realistically, down to the perfect silence experienced in the vacuum of space. The one thing the film doesn't get right is Bowman holding his breath before he blows himself into the airlock. Like a scuba diver ascending too rapidly, holding your breath as you're blown into the vacuum of space would be a true recipe for disaster. With Bowman back in the ship and Hal safely disassembled and everyone in the audience of 1968 relieved we don't have computers inside our homes, I mean, can you imagine? <laughs> the film's climax takes a turn for the existential. Bowman descends into one of the monoliths and travels through a psychedelic stargate before landing in an alien-constructed enclosure that resembles a futuristic version of a room at London's Dorchester Hotel, where he repeatedly runs into increasingly older incarnations of himself, which sounds suspiciously like some of our quarantine experiences. Kubrick originally wanted Bowman to encounter the aliens themselves at the end of the film, and worked hard with his teams through sketches and paintings to come up with something suitably non-human looking. It was actually Carl Sagan who advised Kubrick that any aliens we might encounter would look nothing like us. In the end, the problem of what the aliens would look like was resolved for the production team when they ran out of money and had to finish the movie without them. Given how widely discussed the film's enigmatic third act still is after all these years, that was probably for the best. Upon release, Kubrick's final cut of the film came as a shock to Clark, who had written a great deal of narration to accompany the visuals. He had been thinking of the picture almost along the lines of a prophetic space documentary. Kubrick had removed the narration entirely to allow the visuals to do the talking. The result was a more poetic experience where the viewer could lose themselves, and perhaps even find themselves, within the immense canvas of space. For 1968, Kubrick and his visual effects team did a tremendous job of putting our solar system on film. Some details, such as the Earth having visibly sharp edges rather than the diffuse glow we now know our atmosphere to have, proved inaccurate in time, and some deliberate embellishments were made for the sake of visual artistry. But a lunar landscape and Jupiter and all of its scale remain stunning depictions to this day. We take so much for granted in the age of CGI. It's remarkable to look back and think what Kubrick was able to achieve with just backdrops and miniatures. The way all the future technology is presented in the film is pretty fascinating in and of itself. Rather than highlighting the cool futurism of it all, Kubrick shows us just how very ordinary the tech has become for all those who use it. As we're en route to seeing the wonders of space ourselves, we're shown the passenger of a ship that's just departed Earth asleep in his seat like somebody catching a red eye from SFO to LAX for the umpteenth time, only his pen is adrift in the zero G of the cabin. Now that we've passed the year 2001 and then some, more and more of 2001's future tech is becoming a part of our own everyday lives too. The same passenger who sleeps through the journey into space later places a video call from orbit to chat briefly with his daughter back on Earth. A wild possibility for 1968, and now, apps like FaceTime and Zoom are as common a form of communication as email. 
further on in the film, the sight of two astronauts sitting side by side, each glued to their own tablet-like screen while they eat rather than talking, is actually slightly chilling in its prophecy. Part of you wants to say, boy, they sure had us pegged, with a laugh. And part of you wants to say, boy, they sure had us pegged, as you slowly close your device and sit in contemplation of your dependence on technology for the longest minute of your day. It's all a part of the film's enduring brilliance that more than 50 years after its release, 2001 is showing us and commenting on where we are now in addition to where we are going. We may not have a Hilton in space yet, or a thermonuclear powered rocket that can get us to Jupiter, but every new idea is another step forward in our steady evolution toward the stars. Before you know it, we may all be strapping on Velcro grip shoes before we can freely move about the cabin and waking up to the most wonderfully ordinary views out the window. We will see you next time on Settle the Stars as we walk through the filmmaking and science of Apollo 13, starring Tom Hanks, directed by Ron Howard. In the meantime, happy terraforming. Settle the Stars is a proud member of the Edgeworks Nebula, a collection of intriguing and informative podcasts from Edgeworks Entertainment. Edgeworks Nebula.